Thank you for listening to Crossroads Community Church of Jefferson Hills. At Crossroads, our mission is to be the church by sharing and showing the love of Christ and inviting others to be recipients of Christ's love. Now, here is this week's message from Pastor Floyd Hughes. This morning, we're continuing in a series we're doing called The Road to the Resurrection. Uh, and this week, we're talking about evidence for the Exodus uh, because when you look at uh, the exodus from Egypt and that account in the Bible, God freeing his people from slavery and bondage. It's a picture of what God does for humanity through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you were with us last week, uh, we kind of talked about the fact that Christianity has always been God's plan to redeem humanity. Christianity was always the way that God wanted to bring humankind into relationship uh, with himself. It wasn't, as some people have said, to where Christians, uh, just a few thousand years ago, took all these different stories and then brought them together into this religion. Uh, from the beginning of humanity, God created to humanity that this was going to be his plan, and as humanity kind of spread across the globe, so did the stories of God's plan. Uh, and God's intent was also to free humanity from bondage and sin. Uh, because the Bible says that when, when we're caught up in sin, we're kind of slaves to it. Um, we're, we're just in that state where we can't get out by ourselves. So God decided, hey, I'm going to make a way to free all of you. And we see a picture of that uh, when we look at what happens in the book of Exodus. So uh, if you want to follow along, turn to the book of Exodus, second book in the Bible, chapter one. I'm going to put a lot of the verses up here on the screen, but if you want to follow along, because I want you to see I'm not making this up, all right? So in Exodus chapter one, uh, again, second book in the Bible, this is what we read. Exodus chapter one, it says, these are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Now, prior to this, uh, we talked last week about how God told Abraham, hey, through your offspring, I'm going to have a seed that I use to kind of free humanity, right? Now, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Um, one of those sons, Joseph, was put into slavery by his brothers and ended up in Egypt in a prison. God brought him out of the prison and made him the equivalent of what we would call a prime minister or like vice president, uh, or whatever you want to call it, over the nation of Egypt. While he was in that role, his family, they came there, and he was able to say, hey, because there was a famine in the land, and because of his wisdom, he was able to, he was able to keep the nation of Egypt from really falling into that famine and uh, dealing with all the food hardship consequences because of it. Uh, that's one of the reasons they made him prime minister, but while he was prime minister, his, he was able to bring his family, about 70-ish people, into Egypt and said, here's, here's because they were shepherds, he was like, here's all this, this whole neighborhood or township or borough, whatever you want to call it, called Goshen, with all this great farmland where our family can live and stick out this famine. But they stayed there longer than the famine, because then it says this, Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and they became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So while they were there, they grew from 70 to, at best guesstimates, several hundred thousand. The most uh, conservative estimate is 100,000 men, which easily puts you at anywhere from five, six, seven hundred thousand if you add in women and children, because the men they were counting were usually aged, I think it was 20 to like 45. So let's just say about a half a million people, uh, probably way more than that, but they grew from 70 to half a million people. And this wasn't in one generation, this was over time. Now here's the problem. They're not from Egypt, they're not Egyptian, they grew to about half a million people. And so a new king or pharaoh of Egypt to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. So come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, 
will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So this king who came to power was like Joseph who? I know you guys have this thing about Joseph. I have no idea who Joseph is. I don't care about Joseph. It's the same way, and I'm not trying to get political, but a lot of people today will not take into account what this nation was founded upon and will be like, that was them. The things that were written in the Constitution, they don't matter now. Uh, we're a different people. No, we're the same people, and it still matters. So this king, out of fear incited a nation to say, look, these people are not like us. They are not one of us. And even though they're amongst us, we got to do something about it. And here's what they did about it. They put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Now, I don't know if they still do it. Anyone remember the old Charlton Heston Ten Commandments movie? Yeah, it's a classic. It's the best one. All the remakes, don't waste your time. Even the animated one, don't waste your time. Show your kids the original. I think it's, is it good to show kids the original? I don't know. Just bleep out the parts if there's not. I don't think there's any bad language because that was back in the day. Show your kids that one. But in that, you see them working the slaves to build the cities. Now, here's the thing. There's a reason why I wanted to call this the evidence for the Exodus. Because many people think, well, that's just a story in the Bible. There's no truth to it. And if this huge thing happened with the parting of the Red Sea and all this stuff, wouldn't there be some evidence of it so that we could find it? So here's just a couple of pieces. And I think I shared this years ago when we walked through, we spent like seven months walking through the book of Exodus. Excavations in the early 1800s, and I forget the name of the people that did this, but you can go Google it. They found storehouses in the city of Ramses, just like the Bible said. Now, Moses wrote that around 1400, 1450 BC. But they found these excavations that are just like the Bible said. Also, uh, there is a guy named Rechmeyer. He's an Egyptian noble. He lived in that time, around 1400 BC. He built a tomb with pictures of daily life in Egypt inside the tomb. One of the pictures that he put inside that tomb, he labeled it as this. Slaves making bricks without straw. Anyone remember the part in the account where they started beating them so bad, and because Moses came and said, let my people go, the Pharaoh responded, here's what I'm going to do to your people. They still have to make bricks. They have to make it without straw, and they have to keep the same quota that they did before. So again, this is archaeological evidence. I don't remember what museum or where this is now, but you can go Google this and find this where the stuff from Egypt matches up with what the Bible says. Now, God heard the cries of his people because they were being oppressed. They were being beaten. They were being whipped. They were being mistreated like this. He heard the cries of his people, but he said, I'm going to free them, but it has to be in a way so where no one can say, this wasn't God, this was just people, you know, because all around the world you'll see people that are oppressed and then there's revolutions and they rise up. And you can't always say, well, God did that. So God said, I've got to do this in a way where it's crystal clear that this was a God thing. So uh, when Moses, this is stay in Genesis, I mean Exodus, this is in the book of Acts. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites, because Moses grew up in the household of Pharaoh, right? He was one of the ruling people over the Israelites, but in the book of Acts, Stephen tells us, when he was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. And this was Moses saying, hey, hopefully my people will realize God's using me to rescue them. But they didn't realize it. Because that's not what God was doing. God was definitely going to use him to rescue his people, but he wasn't going to do it that way, right? So when God provides freedom, he does it in a way that ensures we know it was God. So no one can say, well, that was just Moses. He was a powerful leader. Because Moses, in a position of authority in Egypt, if he freed the people, no one would say it was God. That would just say that was just a leader who was kind of sympathetic 
to the plight of the Israelites. So God had to do it in a way where absolutely, positively, no one could say anybody else did this. Right? So turn to, if you're still following, Exodus chapter 3, uh, and we're going to start in verse 7. In Exodus chapter 3, this is what it says. The Lord said, I have indeed, he's speaking to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery, the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned with their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. So God makes it clear. I heard them crying out, I'm going to do this. This is going to be a God thing. It's going to be done in such a powerful way that no one on the planet can proclaim anyone else did this other than God, right? So he says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Now, think about this for a minute. Um, again, not getting political. But here's a leader of the most powerful nation on the planet at that time. And if we stick to the conservatives number, he's got 100,000 men who are working for either free or way less than minimum wage. I think, what do waitresses make? Like two bucks an hour now? He's got a whole bunch of people building buildings and bridges and roads and all that stuff for two bucks an hour. He's not going to let that go. Nobody would let that go. So God says, hey, uh, I'm going to do it. I know that it's, unless it's a mighty hand, a mighty, someone bigger than the most powerful leader in the most powerful nation on the planet at the time. If someone bigger doesn't come along and do it, there's no way he's going to let that go. So God says, I will stretch out my hand. I'm going to strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. Because I hear people all the time say, well, if, if God really exists, why doesn't he do some type of miracle so we know it's him? So God says, hey, you know what? I'm going to do all kinds of miracles so that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is me doing it. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, the Israelites, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask your neighbor and any woman living in our house for articles of silver and gold and clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and you will so plunder the Egyptians. Now, remember this for a minute. Keep this in mind. This is going to come back later in our conversation this morning. But how many people remember in the, uh, well, it's in the Bible, but also in the Charlton Heston version, where Moses went up on the mountain and they built this big golden calf and they started dancing around the golden calf and they were beating drums and doing all that. Did anyone ever wonder, where did slaves get all this gold to build a calf? They got it from the people of Egypt, just like God said. They gave them and they left with what some theologians estimate our millions upon millions of dollars in jewels and gold and all that kind of stuff, right? But here's, here's also what God said in Exodus chapter 6. This is, again, God speaking to Moses. He says, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. So now he's taking a step for These aren't just going to be miracles and wonders. They're going to be acts of judgment. And he says, I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So he says, I'm going to do this so that Pharaoh knows beyond a shadow of a doubt this was God. But I also want you as the people of God to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was God uh, who was doing this, right? And uh, then... If you jump forward, right, he says, he will not listen to you. He's talking to, again to uh, Moses. Then I will lay my hand on G or the Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So this is now, it's even one further. He says, I want Pharaoh to know that this was God. I want you, the Israelites, to know. But he also says, I want the Egyptian people to know that I am the Lord and that God did this. Now, here's the thing. 
I'm going to come back to this in a minute. They, they, they leave. They go through the Red Sea. God trashes the army in the ocean. They get on the other side. They wander in the desert for 40 years. And then finally, 40 years later, the next generation, Joshua brings them into the promised land that God promised to bring them to. And here's what they encounter. And you remember the story where Joshua sends the spies into the promised land? They go in, and before the spies lay down for the night because they were hiding, there's a woman, her name is Rahab, went up on the roof and said to them, this is 40 years later, she said, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and then a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. She said, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. And this is, she says this, when we heard of what your God did 40 years ago, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. So God seemingly accomplished what he wanted. He wanted Pharaoh to know. Uh, he wanted uh, the Israelites to know. He wanted Egyptians to know. And he wanted the world to know, hey, when I free you from slavery, I want everyone beyond a shadow of a doubt to know that this is God. And it's true, the same thing today. When God provides freedom, he does it in a way that ensures that everyone knows this was God. And we get weirded out and we tend not to believe. When we hear of people saying, I kept going to the doctors over and over, they couldn't figure out what's wrong. I went back, had my church family pray for me, went back to the doctors and they were like, the problem is God. Over and over and over we hear stories like this and we're like, well, that doesn't mean it was God. But if the doctors sit there and say, I can't explain this and I didn't do this, then it might be God, because when God provides freedom from something, he does it in a way so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's God freeing us from body. So God does what he said he's going to do. He hammers down 10 different plagues on the nation of Israel. Over a relatively short period of time, uh, most is weeks to a few months. And think about this, those plagues were... Uh, pestilence, uh, there was the river turning to blood, there was animals that just instantly, all their cattle and horses and whatever just instantly died, uh, there was uh, a plague of darkness, all of these things. If you think about, if we today went through that, that would bring the nation to its knees. There was economic chaos, there was medical uh, needs, and they didn't have the medical facilities we had today. So many people did not survive that time of those plagues. And again, um, here's the thing, because God says, the reason I'm doing this is so that I can bring out my people who are being oppressed, and they were being beaten, and they were being misused, and they were being mistreated. And I hear people all the time say, what kind of God would bring all these plagues on the people? How is that a God of justice? How is that a God of mercy? And here's the thing. This is a God who kept going to the leader of the nation and saying, none of this has to happen. Let my people go. Don't oppress them. Just let them go. And then uh, back and forth, back and forth with the leader, again, didn't want to let go of that free slave labor. Now, here's the thing. Uh, those plagues, they may sound weird. They may sound like, well, this is just a Bible story. There can't be a plague of gnats and a plague of flies and a river turning to blood and all that stuff. But again, there's a reason we're calling this evidence for the Exodus because uh, there was a man named Ipuer, and I probably am butchering his name, who wrote uh, this document. It's called the Ipuer Papyrus because papyrus is what they wrote on at that time. He wrote it around 1400 BC. This actual document, and I'm going to butcher the name of this museum, it's held in the, whatever that R says is, Van Oudeheden in Leiden, Netherlands. There's a museum in the Netherlands where this document that has, not by Christians, by archaeologists, found and dated to 1400 BC. Here is what that document says. In it, Ipure is an Egyptian official at the time. I don't know in what capacity. But he claims, hey, the river is full of blood and our city is in chaos because of plague 
and pestilence, which kind of mirrors exactly the plagues that God unleashed on the nation of Israel. He also says that the power of Ra was not seen. Ra was the sun god. And this is what you would expect someone to say if you experience three days of darkness. Not three nights during a power outage, uh, but three days and nights of total darkness where the sun was not seen. And this is something he also says. He says all the children are dying which is what you would expect, although it wasn't just children, but when you experience the plague of the firstborn, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but he also said this, and this is why I told you to hold on to that and remember that, and it was very specific. He said, all the slaves took all the gold and silver, which is what God told them to do. He said, I want you to ask all your neighbors for stuff. Some people gave out of fear, some people gave out of respect, but God said, you're going to plunder the Egyptians. And they left with tons, millions of dollars of gold, millions of dollars uh, of silver. Now, the tenth plague was the game changer. Because it, no matter what, what, what the other plagues were, even though they brought the nation to its knees, Pharaoh kept saying, I'm not going to let the people go. But the tenth plague was the plague of the firstborn. Um, and it caused Pharaoh to change his mind. So in Exodus chapter 11, this is what it says. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt, and after that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. He said, this is, this is going to be the game changer. This is going to be the one that makes Pharaoh say, I am done. Uh, in verse 2 or 3, he says, tell the people that men and women are alike, ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold again. And the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and Moses himself, highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. And by this time, many of the people who at first were like, why are we listening to this man Moses? Let's just do what we want to do. But by the end of this, they were like, hey, we need to let these people go. And they had more respect for Moses than they probably did uh, for Pharaoh, right? And then this is what it says. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. And I've heard people say that God sent an angel. I've heard people say, I think in the Charlton Heston thing, it's just a black cloud that looks like squid ink that comes down and just covers the houses. But let's be crystal clear. God said, I'm going to free the people. And God told Moses at midnight, I'm going to be the one that goes throughout Egypt. I'm going to do this firsthand, right? And he said, every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of cattle as well. And we have to think about this. Some people say that this is kind of harsh. This is kind of drastic. It is, but it has to be crystal clear. And this is what God was saying. This is a God thing. There is no plague that can target the firstborn. If a plague comes, it's, there are plagues that will just kill men. There are plagues that might just kill women. There are plagues that might just kill the elderly. There are plagues that might just kill the infants. But it's got to be engineered, for lack of a better term, by, human, or by a, an intelligence in order to determine this is the firstborn son, this is the firstborn son, this, and in that house, you're the firstborn granddad, you're the firstborn father, you're the firstborn son. That doesn't happen by natural consequences. That happened by the hand of God so that no one could say this was just some natural thing that could be explained away, right? And uh, God said, there will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And it's not that God was racist. It's not that God was doing any of that. The distinction came by faith and by action because God specifically told them, here's what you're to do. And every household that did it, that put faith in what God said and actually did it, those were the people that were saved. That is the same thing that we experience through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is open to anyone who expresses that faith in Jesus Christ. So 
jumping to ver- chapter 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year, because what he was about to do was something brand new, and everything in the past they needed to let go. And whenever God brings you out of something, it's okay to realize this is where I came from, but he doesn't want you to bring that baggage with you. He wants you to let it go. So this was to be the first start of their month, first start of them as a nation. And he says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of the 10th month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. And then they are to take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. It wasn't just, hey, I believe God's going to do this. You had to step forward and take some action to express your belief in what God was about to do. And he says, on that same night, again, this is God doing it, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. God wasn't just delivering his people. Uh, In another verse, it says he was judging all the false gods gods of Egypt, and many of the Egyptians, it is believed, uh, some of them even left with the Israelites when they left um, out of, out of uh, Israel, but then he, uh, or out of Egypt. And then he says, the blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. All of these plagues, all of these things, all of these things that God did to free his people, and yet people will still say, it's just a story. So I'm going to give you one more piece of evidence on why we know this whole account is true. Uh, There is a guy named Manasseh, and around 300 BC, he was an Egyptian priest uh, of the uh, sun god Ra. He was also a historian. So he took the time to look back and research the history of his people. This is 1,100 years after everything that happened in the Exodus. And this is not someone who says, hey, let me read the Bible and see what it says. This is someone who sat down and said, let me research the history of my people, the Egyptians, and here are some of the things that he found. And you can go Google this letter. Again, it's archaeological archaeological letter that historians found. This wasn't Christians that found it. He found and he wrote that there were people from Canaan who came into the land of Egypt and then were kicked out by agreement. That's kind of, yeah, by agreement. You stop killing our people and decimating our country and we will let you go. But he also said these same people from Canaan that were kicked out by agreement, they wandered in the desert after leaving Egypt which we read in the Bible that the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. And even if someone said, this could be anybody, this doesn't have to be the Israelites. That doesn't mean the Bible is true. This person wrote, people from Canaan came in, they were kicked out by agreement, they wandered in the desert after leaving Egypt, and then they went and built a temple in Jerusalem. And there's only one people on the planet that have ever done that. And that is the Israelite people following the prompting of God. So even though there are people who don't want to believe what happened, there's so much historical evidence. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and I listened. I was like, here's just, I didn't even list all, here's a couple of things that people outside of the Bible have found historically that supports the claims of the Bible. And their response to me was, even if archaeologists found it, and even if it's ingrained on the wall, which there is actually in Egypt, one of the, they found a, a column where it says uh, the nomadic people of Yahweh were one of the people that Egypt tried to conquer. Um, he said, even if it were ingrained on the wall, I still wouldn't believe it's true because there's so many people that don't want to accept truth. And if they're not willing to accept the truth about this, then they're definitely not willing to accept the truth about what Jesus did on the cross, even though he did it to set them free. Because the blood of the lamb was a sign that no wrongs were done and that those covered by it had been redeemed. That's the reason why it was put on the house. And the same is true for us. So uh, I'm going to throw a bunch of verses up on the screen where we're going to sing, uh, and then we're going to pray. But this is, this is what the Bible says. In the book of Matthew, it says this. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, 
And praising God, gave thanks and asked him, meaning God, to bless it to their use. And when he had taken it, he gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which ratifies the agreement and is being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The only reason that Jesus had to die was so that the death, uh, uh, because the wages of sin, our wrongdoing is death, because God is a just God. And just as if someone did something horrible to one of our family members, we would want justice. God wants justice. And that justice calls for our blood, but instead of us having to pay it, Jesus paid it on our behalf. And then in the book of Ephesians, it says, in him, meaning Jesus Christ, we have redemption, deliverance, salvation through his blood, the remission or forgiveness of our offenses, our shortcomings, our trespasses, our sins, our wrongdoings, in accordance with the riches and generosity of his gracious favor. And then you jump to the book of um, Colossians, in chapter 1, it says, And God purposed that through, by the service and the intervention of him, Jesus the Son, all things should be completely reconciled back to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, as through him the Father made peace by means of the blood of his cross. Previously, because of our wrongdoings, the justice and morality of God said, hey, I need to go to war against these people because they deserve to die for the wrongs that they have done, not just against God, but what we do against one another. But instead, God sent his son, an eternal being, and his blood was shed. So rather than now looking at us as enemies of God, he looks at us with the peace of God because of the blood shed on the cross. And we looked at this when we were walking through the book of First John a couple of weeks ago. If we really are living and walking in the light, as he himself was in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses and removes us from all sin and guilt. Over and over and over, we're told over and over and over that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses us. Jesus rescued humanity from a death sentence, just like the Israelites in Egypt were rescued from a death sentence. And every single person, any person, just like any person could go into a household that was covered with the blood in Egypt and be saved, any person can accept the finished work of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and receive the peace of God. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. God, we are so grateful that despite our wrongdoings, despite our transgressions, despite the way that we have done things wrong to you and to one another, things that transgress your righteousness, your justice, and your morality, that you don't look at us and say that we have done too much wrong. You don't look at us and say that we can never be a part of your family. You look at us and say, because Jesus paid the penalty for our wrongs, that you want us to be a part of your family. We're grateful that despite our sins, despite all the things that we've done wrong, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. We're grateful that even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, that you still love us. And we're grateful that that offer is still open to any and all of us today, that you tell us we don't have to pray a prayer, that we don't have to read a book, we just need to come to you in an act of faith and believe what you did. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Uh, thank you, guys. I realize we went a little bit longer today. Uh, pray that you guys have an awesome rest of your Sunday. Uh, God bless, and hopefully see everyone next week. Do me a favor, though, because there's a lot of people. I mean, I mean, Chris is not here um, I can't think of everyone's name. A couple other people that haven't been around. Just pray for them. Make sure they're okay. Because some people, I found, uh, they're sitting at home wondering, why hasn't anyone reached out to me or called me or check on me? Uh, and sometimes I am really bad at that. I forget about that. Plus, I don't want them to think the only reason I'm calling is, why aren't you in church? I'm just calling to make sure you're not dead in a ditch somewhere and make sure you're okay. 
But if you think of someone in the room that, oh, yeah, I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. Like, it's very rare that Joe is not here. I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. And God puts it on your heart, just reach out to them this week, call them, pray for them, and connect with them. Other than that, pray that you guys have an awesome rest of your Sunday. Uh, God bless, and see everyone next week. We hope you enjoyed the message. If you did, please leave a comment on our webpage, crossroadsofjeffersonhills.com, or our Facebook page. You can also join our Sunday celebration every Sunday at 1037 a.m. We look forward to hearing from you online or in person. Thank you and God bless.